Hello everyone, I'm Michelle Malanka with the World Green Building Council. I'd like to welcome you today to the World GBC Sustainable Cities Initiative Speaker Series. Today we are delighted to have Andrea Reimer, Deputy Mayor of the City of Vancouver, as our speaker. She's going to be talking to us about Vancouver's award-winning Greenest City Action Plan. And before I hand over to Andrea, I would like to take a moment to do a little bit of housekeeping. And that is to let you know that Andrea will be presenting for about 25 minutes, and then we're going to open the floor to questions for about a 25 minute question and answer period. If you have any questions during the presentation or during the question and answer period, please put them in that chat box, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we are recording this presentation, so I will need to keep everyone on mute. So that box is the best way to keep in touch with me, your moderator. Before we get started, I also wanted to just share the number of people from different cities that we have calling in from all over the world. So I went and looked at the registration list and I could tell who from was calling in from which places. And so far registered, we have people calling in from Boulder, Colorado, Sydney, Australia, Wyndham, Australia, Stockholm, Mos Moscow, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, London, Madrid, Cape Town, Lima, Peru, Accra, Ghana, Warsaw, San Salvador, Jakarta, and Dublin. It will be really fantastic if all those people actually do uh, call in. Um, and if for some reason uh, you're on the phone or you've, uh, or on the, basically if you've called in through your computer and you want to let me know what city you're in because you didn't hear me mention it, then uh, please uh, type that into the chat box for us. One final thing before we get started is I wanted to let you know that the World GBC is going to be offering a study tour to Vancouver in the first week in June, and we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Greenest City Action Plan policy that Andrea is going to be sharing with us today, and I'm going to have more details on that program at the end of this, at the end of this session. So without uh, further ado, I would like to... Um, Make, I would like to introduce Andrea Reimer. She is Deputy Mayor of the City of Vancouver. She's also on the Vancouver City Council. She, um, before, she was really instrumental in getting this Greenest City, Action, Greenest City 2020 Action Plan up and running. So we are thrilled to have her here. And for those of you who will be joining us on our tour to Vancouver, she's going to be with us during a, during a workshop there as well. Now, Andrea, hopefully you are able to see um, your as a presenter now. I hope so. I hope you can all see the Vancouver City of Destiny slide that I've got up. Let's see if I can see it. Yes, I can see it. So I think we should be good. Excellent. So shall I launch in? Please go right ahead. OK, thanks. Um, I was going to say good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm guessing there's evenings and mornings and all sorts of time zones taking place right now. It's really a pleasure to join you all um, to be able to speak a bit about Vancouver's effort to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. Um, so I was asked to speak to kind of the what of all of that, um, but I find that it's helpful to start with the why. Certainly when we first launched this initiative, we were first elected to government in late 2008. Um, and in 2009, January, we started getting going on this. And I can't tell you how many people kept saying, why Why would a city want to be the greenest city in the world? Um, as Canadians, well, I think we have a mayor in Toronto or a recently former mayor who may have redefined our global image. But um, generally speaking, we're fairly self-deprecating and we don't try and be the best at anything in the world, especially living next to the Americans that can be hard to achieve. So this concept of being the best at something was a, a, a big shift in thinking for the city of Vancouver. Um, some years ago, 2007, um, before I was elected to city council, I was leading the largest environmental, the largest membership-based environmental organization in Canada, and in that role was selected as one of the early Canadian trainees um, in, in former Vice President Al Gore's effort to give inconvenient truth presentations around, um, well, around the world, really, when it really got going. Um, and he, at the time, had this proverb that he gave us at the training, and the, the proverb was, if you want to go fast, go alone. 
And if you want to go far, go together. So it's this lovely statement, but I think every single one of the 50 of us in the room, we're all thinking the same thing. On climate and on green issues generally, we need to go far and fast. So how do we do that? And Green City is kind of the city of Vancouver's um, answer to that question, or at least our attempt to answer that question. So there's four key ingredients that we see as essential to our efforts to be the greenest city in the world. Um, and I'm going to speak to those um, as we go through the presentation. Uh-oh. I'm going to try and change the slide is what I'm going to do. Oh, that's not good. I have not um, actually practiced changing slides. Okay, let's see. There we go. So uh, the greenest city in the world effort, um, our goal, we started in early 2009. The mayor formed an action team with a mandate to make recommendations on how Vancouver can become the greenest city in the world by 2020. As I said, we see there was four key ingredients that were critical to our success. Um, the first is leadership. The second is having a strategic plan. The third is taking action. And the fourth is partnership. Um, two notable things about that list. Uh, a, it's not rocket science. You probably all are thinking, wow, that's it. Those are the four things you need. We've got those things, which is great. Um, I would also say that it's not specific to the work of Green the City that any organization, especially a large organization, but even a family or a, a, a small workplace trying to undertake transformative change on any issue, that those four key ingredients are essential to success. Before I launch into the four and how um, how they've worked for us, I did want to give you a bit of context about Vancouver. Um, Vancouver is one of 21 cities in a metropolitan region on the west coast of Canada in a province called British Columbia. We have a population in the metro region across all 21 cities of about 2.3 million. These numbers are a little out of date now. We're a very fast growing region of Canada, so we're probably up closer to 2.5 million since the last census. Um, as you can see, we're spread across a reasonably large geographic area, um, which is not uncommon in the North American context. Um, Vancouver itself is by far the most dense of the cities in the region, but I'll get to that. Um, relatively affluent average income, um, and of course immigration is a key factor in Canadian cities. Um, Vancouver, or the metro region, um, has a high level, but the city of Vancouver itself has an even higher level. So we have roughly 6,000 residents per square kilometer, which is quite dense by North American standards. Um, our average income is slightly higher than the region, although our cost of housing is much higher than the rest of the region. Um, and as you see, more than, well, this number now is closer to 55% of our residents do not speak English as a first language. For some of you who are familiar with the Canadian concept of bilingualism, um, I'll let you know that French is not the other language they speak. Um, French is actually a, a relatively rare language in the city of Vancouver. It's about uh, it's below 10th most common language. And the two large groups are Mandarin and Cantonese speakers. Um, but we also have significant Filipino, Vietnamese, and South Asian populations. Uh, other good things to know about Vancouver, um, because of the cost of housing, our low income population is extremely high by Canadian standards. Uh, we're not a particularly young city, uh, but we do have, people are surprised to hear that we are along the Canadian average of having children because people don't equate, um, I think maybe a more familiar example is New York where people don't expect children and families to be living on the island of Manhattan. We have roughly the same density as they do, um, but here in Vancouver we see children and families living at the same percentage as they would in the outlying regions. Uh, we also are a majority renters in the city. Uh, and the final thing, and an important one, if you're a municipal government decision maker, when we go to bed at night, there's 600,000 of us. But by the time noon rolls around on a weekday, we have a million people in the city because we are the, the region's primary employers are all in Vancouver. So those people don't um, pay taxes. They don't come with their own garbage cans. They don't, they don't have their own police force. Like we have to find a way to pay for all the services for that extra 400,000 people without having a revenue, a, a way to generate revenue to provide those services, generally speaking, not universally. Okay, so that's us. Uh, so why would a city dealing with you know, 400,000 people that don't give us taxes, but we have to provide services for. Um, obviously, you can see in those stats that we have a very large low-income population. We have extraordinary housing and affordability challenges, one of the worst, um, one of the worst 
or least affordable cities in the world, um, why then would we carve off this concept of being the greenest city in the world? Um, first off, the leadership question. Um, this is our mayor, Mayor Gregor Robertson. I am a member of his party and our group was elected, as I said, in late 2008. So we just got elected to our third term about three months ago. Uh, so obviously a, a well-supported program by the city of Vancouver amongst other priorities that we have. Um, I think the one message I would leave with you here, Vancouver has a long history of councillors, uh, city councillors who have been active on green issues. We've always had at least one, sometimes two, once in a while three. Um, but the key lesson that I have learned both as an environmental advocate, um, working on policy at the national and provincial level, um, and now as a city policymaker, is that if you really want to do that go far, go fast, um, transformative change, you need a leader who leads. So it doesn't matter that the counselor's into it because the best they'll get to do is a pilot project or a, some form of incremental change and surely that's better than nothing in the absence of a leader who's leading on green, but if you really want to push forward in your company, in your labor union, uh, in your in your school community, wherever it is, you need the principal, you need the CEO, you need the board chair fully bought in on the concept of whatever the big aspirational goals are that you're pushing. So in this case, um, having a mayor who is all in on the question of greenest city by 2020 has made a fundamental difference. Uh, so on to the question of the strategic plan. Um, I'm guessing every single one of us on the call has a plan. Uh, that plan might be to go to bed when I'm not talking because you're in a time zone where that would make sense. It might be to have lunch, which is one of my plans after we're off the phone. Um, but in terms of whether or not that thing will happen, um, it, it's about the strategy that you're bringing into play. A friend of mine says that some is not a number and soon is not a time, that you have to have a plan that's both strategic and how it, it approaches the context you're working in, but also is able to provide clear measurable targets uh, so quantifiable targets and give them a timeline. So in the case of the Green and City Action Plan, we have 10 policy areas that we looked at. Um, at the time that we were developing it, 2008, 2009, um, the, the sort of uh, orientation of global plans, different cities around the world, was really on the climate question. We thought that climate was important, for sure. It was one of our 10 areas, but we really didn't want a situation where uh, we were solving a climate problem, but potentially creating a waste problem or a water problem or another problem because we're so focused on solving one without understanding um, part of the reason it exists is because we pursue policy in silos. So we, we gave a mandate to this team that they had to look at 10 broad areas and provide targets for each of those. So what resulted from that is uh, 15 targets. You can see they're, they're grouped together into three areas. The so zero carbon, it's impossible to get the climate target, obviously, without also getting the building targets and the transportation targets. Um, similarly, we can't get the climate target without also having the waste target, but waste is important for more reasons than um, just climate. You're also looking at a material recovery environment, um, and I think probably the most basic expression of green, which is really, if you had to give it a... Um, a simple to understand concept framework, green is at its base about efficient use of resources and certainly waste, the more waste you have, um, that's, that's the indicator that you don't actually have a green economy or a, a green uh, human ecosystem because you're producing waste out of that system, whether those are emissions or physical garbage. Um, the third area, which has four um, policy areas in it is healthy ecosystems, so we have access to nature, water, air, and food. We're quite fortunate to live in a part of the world that has abundant fresh water. Uh, the downside of that is that we use a lot of that water. Um, historically, we have done a good job of protecting green space, but as population and affordability pressures grow, that becomes more and more challenging. Uh, and then, of course, uh, food is a, a critical issue when you're talking about any area of environmental policy. And finally, we have overarching goals. The green economy piece was quite critical to us that this not be about the economy or the environment. Um, I'm sure many of you know that our national government has certainly set up that framework that we're, we need to go after fossil fuels and that you know we'll look after the environment later. Um, but from our perspective, the, the cities that will prosper in the coming 
um, decades will be the ones that own green first, and certainly that's been playing out for us as a city, as I'll get to. And then lighter footprint, which is a harder one, but this is about externalities. So while we can control the footprint of our buildings, our transportation, our waste, um, we are importing a great deal of products from other areas that may or may not be doing that, and how are we controlling our overall footprint? So uh, those are, that's the plan. Uh, the plan, I should say, and I forgot to put the slide in, um, we have all of these targets. We'll just go back for a minute. Um, they are all published. We do an annual implementation uh, update on it so that the public is able to follow along. This is quite critical in our opinion, not just to show our successes, but also to show our failures, because frankly, it's our failures where we're learning the most. Um, happy to address it in questions, but our initial attempts at green buildings were very focused on retrofit strategies because that was sort of the, the U.S. was investing heavily in um, uh, economic stimulus packages, green jobs were a big piece of that, retrofits was sort of the natural place. So, you know, we went running off after retrofits in one of the most economically successful cities in the world with some of the lowest energy. I, I could go on, but a number of factors led to it being quite a substantial failure. Um, but from that, we learned that you can't just cut and paste policies off the shelf. You really have to look at the goals you have, the context you're working in, and what strategy is going to be the most effective when you align those two. So the third piece I wanted to speak to is action. So all of that planning that I just showed you, um, it looks so simple on those four slides. Um, but really, we started in February or January 2009. It wasn't until July 2011 that we finally passed the plan. And for any of you that have worked on even a climate plan, you know how long these things take. Imagine having 10 um, moving pieces that you have to fit together. Uh, so for us, it was quite critical. And before we even started planning, and we actually launched, as you can see in the mayor's hand there, uh, a document called the Quick Start Recommendation. So the purpose of the Quick Start um, was to not set up a framework where plan and then act became uh, the way that we would go about it. Two reasons for that. One is that I am very action driven and I think it would have driven me quickly crazy to spend two years planning and not doing anything. Um, but also the public needed to see, the public doesn't have the patience to wait um, for planning. And it's not because they're impatient people, it's because they're busy people. And in order for them to see the relevance in their daily lives, something needs to be happening in their daily lives. And planning exercises for most people are not something that's going to intersect their daily lives very much. So right off the top, we did this quick start recommendations. There were 54 of them. And by the time the plan was passed, in July 2011, we had actually completed 84 separate policy initiatives that had been uh, recommended by staff, the public, external organizations. Um, and the result of that was that actually our engagement in the planning process was much higher um, and much more positive because it wasn't theoretical about whether we were doing something. People did not show up to fight the fact that we were doing something because that clearly wasn't on the table. Um, but they saw how these actions were relevant and or impacting them, and they felt compelled to come and participate. And the end result was that we had over 180 different organizations ranging academic, uh, labor, business, faith groups cultural communities, um, other levels of government, um, and in addition to that, 35,000 residents, which in a city of 600,000 is a pretty substantial number to have all involved in an engagement. So some of the actions that we were able to complete, um, the concept, I think all of us across the world are struggling with this concept of bike lanes. Um, when we were putting it in, it was front page news, not just in our city, the, the separated bike lane, the first one that we put in, but actually it became a national news story that was persistent and pervasive. On the day that this bike lane actually opened, um, we had no fewer than five helicopters from different news outlets, which I didn't even know we had that many in British Columbia, um, but we had them all hovering over it. It, it sort of felt like, like Armageddon was about to happen in the city, but as you can see, um, it's a pretty low-key activity, and as a result, there's less cars on the left of the screen because these people are able to get in their bikes. It, it has calmed down a bit, um, but certainly it was a provocative, it definitely helped provoke the discussion. I had originally thought that this was a North American issue, that the concept of reallocating road space to bikes is a, a fairly radical idea on a continent where car drivers often literally feel like they own the road. But um, 
it turns out many of us are struggling with the same problem. Interestingly, this bike lane costs less than one per one tenth of one percent of the city's annual capital budget. Its maintenance costs are about ten grand a year um, compared to the road next to it, which costs substantially more. And if you're involved in municipal systems, you'll know that the maintenance costs are much, much higher. Uh, this completely eclipsed the bike lane discussion. Um, this program, which was one of our quick starts, which was to start diverting organic waste out of our um, waste stream. Uh, organic waste counts for about 40% of our waste stream. I'm happy to say that five years into the program, we have done a phenomenal job. We're now up at about 68% um, diversion as a result of the organic. A very intensive program that affected every single person in the city. It probably got one news article for every hundred that the bike lanes did and has been a phenomenal success. We also have an issue around uh, waste from houses, so we've done some innovative things on deconstruction of houses. These guys are not building this house, they're actually um, systematically deconstructing it so the materials can be recovered. We did work on drinking water, uh, making it more publicly accessible to people and communities. We did a lot of work on food. This was actually our first quick start to put a city hall garden. Uh, we started the Green City Action Plan. We had zero urban farms in the city of Vancouver. As I noted, it's quite dense, so it would be surprising to see a farm. Um, but here you see this one, and actually this is one of 19 urban farms within our city limits now. That it's been a big success story for us, not just in food production, but in job production, aimed primarily at that low-income community that I was mentioning. Uh, energy is a big issue for us. Uh, we are, let's just see, oh, uh, let's go back here a minute. Uh, so uh, solar, it's a city where it rains a lot and certainly you can capture solar. It's not one of the most efficient um, ways for us to capture energy. Um, so we've really looked at district energy systems. This picture I showed you at the beginning when I was laying out our Green City mandate, um, this building is actually one of quite a few that comprise 3.5 million square feet of building or built space um, that are heated by a district energy utility, this little guy. Um, and this little guy uses uh, waste heat from sewage to be able to create um, the energy that it needs. And that's resulted in the 76% greenhouse gas reduction for the communities affected. We have since developed a neighborhood energy strategy for the entire city and are in the process of rolling that out so that all of our neighborhoods can benefit from that. As a result of that, um, we, we do have most of our electricity produced uh, renewably in Vancouver already, so we're really looking at the fossil fuel-based heat energy. By the year 2020, we're confident that we can move to 100% renewables in the city of Vancouver. Uh, there is, of course, the challenge of the existing built form, um, the retrofit strategy, and as I mentioned, that, that has been a challenge for us. Uh, transportation, a big issue for all of us, but particularly in the North American context. We have had huge successes with it, in part because we, uh, many years ago, decided to stop a freeway from coming into the city of Vancouver. So we've always had this challenge of building complete, complete compact communities. Um, some of the notable successes, um, bikes, as I mentioned, but also the concept of car share. We were the third location on the planet for car to go. Um, we're cents per capita by far their largest user. And in a city where housing costs are so high, parking costs are high too. Even the access to land is high. So the concept of car sharing has taken off um, hugely. And certainly if you're like myself and under um, 45, chances are you don't own a car. Um, and new registrations, new licenses for cars are down dramatically. So as younger people are, are getting to that age, they're choosing not to drive because this or own a car because this option is available to them. Okay, our transportation system too became the third largest in North America behind Mexico City and New York during the Olympic Games. We were able to leverage that into permanent um, masks of shift. 25% of those riders um, continued after the Olympics because they took the system and went, it's convenient. Uh, and I want to keep doing this. It's cheaper and more relaxing than driving, and that's been a huge success story. And, of course, electric vehicles. Um, our goal with vehicles is to have 50% uh, plus one of people not taking single occupancy vehicles by the year 2020, but for those that are, that they have this option available. As a result of this, uh, this slide is more to show you the difference between Vancouver and Toronto because we exist in the same uh, national context. Um, 
so it shows you that we're we're doing twice as well as they are, despite having the same national government framework to to work with, which shows you how much cities can do regardless of what their national governments are doing. We did meet our Kyoto. Our country did not meet its Kyoto commitments, but we have met our Kyoto commitments, um, and we'll continue on that. And and less. Do you think that's been easy? It hasn't, um, because our population, as I mentioned, has been growing quite fast, 27% increase, um, and the economy is also growing quite fast with an 18% increase over that time period. So the last piece I wanted to bring to your attention on the action side was the green economy. Um, we do have a green job strategy. Um, the concept was to double the number of green and local jobs. What we found was that nobody actually has a definition that's static for green jobs, so creating that definition uh, using the United Nations one as a, a base point. We then did a methodology. Uh, again, we found nobody had a methodology, so that took a significant amount of time to develop. But this is a picture of green jobs in the city of Vancouver as of uh, last fall was when we finally had the methodology, and I'm happy to share it with folks if they'd like it. 4.9% uh, of all jobs in the city of Vancouver and growing quite rapidly, as you can see. It's up 20% since 2010 when we brought in the the target, um, and you can see the different, uh, obviously green buildings is a, a intuitive one, but the other areas. Interestingly, waste and materials management and recycling hasn't been a big one yet, which surprised us, but we're continuing to do more research to understand that. Um, as a result of the diversification of Canada's economy and the global fall of oil prices, um, our economy will be by far the fastest growing of any city in Canada over the next year, assuming that oil prices stay where they are. So the lesson here isn't that green is good and oil is bad, but that you need to have a diverse economy, you need a strategy, and you need a vision um, that you're working towards in order to be successful in a modern economy in a globalized world. So the last piece I'll talk through is partnership. So I think intuitively when we think partnerships, we think external partnerships. Um, but really, the success of the Green City Action Plan has been about partnerships at three different levels. So the first one is actually internal engagement. Um, this was not a project of the Office of Sustainability or Engineering or whatever department you might associate with um, uh, planning and development in the case of buildings. It was a project that brought together people from across departments, across the organization, um, to be able to co-collaborate and solve big challenges. So social policy becomes as relevant as the planning and the architect in terms of figuring out how do you both change the green built form, but also the social behaviors that underlie that and meeting the needs of the vulnerable population. Uh, we also did extensive stakeholder engagement. There were over 180 organizations, as I mentioned, involved in the development of the plan. What's amazing is those people now own the plan, literally. So we have survived two elections, uh, the first of which was quite contentious and focused uh, solely on the question of the, the Greenest City Plan. Um, we were returned with a larger majority than we originally had, not because we were so fantastic at defending the plan, um, but because the community itself owns the plan, and particularly through our large organizations and organizations of all size. So the way this is organized is we have the Greenest City 2020 Steering Committee at the center. Um, each of the 10 policy areas has an internal advisory committee, which is the green circles, that's cross-departmental, and then the pink circles are where we bring in the stakeholders onto the external advisory committee. And then as you can see, public, you know, the public can interact with it as they choose to. Um, the public was quite involved in the development of the plan. Uh, we kicked it off originally back in 2009 with a, a public event. Um, we originally had planned for 300 people. Uh, it sold out in the first few hours, and, and we were actually charging people to come and give us advice, uh, but it sold out, $10 a ticket. Uh, we booked a larger venue for 500. It sold out. Finally, we booked the largest venue in Vancouver. I had 2,000 plus residents come um, and had another 1,000 on a waiting list who wanted to get involved. So the important thing isn't that all those people came, it's that we had a way to stay connected with them. So as they came out into the lobby of the event that day, um, we made them give us their ideas, but most importantly, their name and their email address, because what we wanted to do was take this 2,000 that were highly engaged, willing to pay 10 bucks to come out to this event, um, and get them to connect with their people in their community. So out of that 2,000, we were able to grow into 9,500, and from that 9,500 out to 35,000. 
uh, so you see these, this is a woman who was at our original Green City event in the theater. Um, she wanted to hold uh, an outdoor dinner with her neighbors and talk about what the Green City Action Plan meant to them and how they could be engaged, and that's what they're doing right here. Everybody was driven towards a website which I know is a very common strategy, but the innovation of this website was that you could put your idea down on the website and, and rally your friends to vote for it alongside the members of our Green City Action Team or the mayor could put his ideas on. Um, and those, the, the ordering of those ideas was actually um, honored in the last plan. So the community definitely owned this plan and the priorities for how we were going to take action on these big targets. Um, not only has this won elections and, and allowed the plan to endure, these blue dots represent all the citizen-initiated and resident-initiated projects that are happening as of yesterday around the city. We have a map on our website um, that we keep updated. We also have partner projects that I didn't overlay because it would have just looked like a big mess. Um, but as you can see, it's certainly not the city of Vancouver solely doing this work. It's a community at every level that's engaged on it. Uh, so the final thing, yes, this is the final thing I wanted to say. Um, we know that this built form is fundamentally unsustainable, right? Like we know that if this is how what cities look like, um, we're just not going to be able, sorry, we're not going to be able to meet the goals, but I think to put a finer point on it, we as a species probably will not be able to survive um, in the coming decades. And we're already seeing the, the kinds of impacts that are just shadows of what we can expect from climate modeling in terms of extreme weather. Uh, the challenge is, is that we don't know for sure whether this built form is what we need or what built form it is. And I think that's the big lesson of the Green City Plan it isn't that we have the leadership or the plan or the action um, or even the partnerships, but that we have constant feedback loops in that, that we're prepared to challenge our assumptions, we're prepared to accept failure, and we're prepared to take it um, and really put it out there and figure out how we can learn from it and continue to push forward. It's not enough to be against uh, this guy. You also have to keep pushing for figuring out what you are for. So the question of whether Vancouver can be the greenest city in the world, uh, still unanswered. Uh, we've won a lot of awards, which is good feedback, but doesn't actually get you the greenest city in the world. We were really pleased to get the World Green Building Council Award. Uh, we've had over 2,000 cities from around the world that we interact with and share policy. They both um, help us write ours, but we also write theirs, which is a, an interesting thing to be sitting in, in Vancouver realizing your impact on policies around the world. 40% reduction in waste, 10% increase in active transportation, 18% uh, decrease in water. We've had a 6% overall community greenhouse gas emission decline and 10% per capita. The discrepancy, of course, is the growing population. 3,200 new green jobs, and we were recently uh, listed as the fourth greenest city in the world, whereas in 2009, we were so irrelevant that we weren't even on the, the map of what they were evaluating. Um, so all to say that, yes, we probably can become the greenest city in the world. Um, the question that now sits in my mind is whether that is a sustainable or not, because I don't feel like we're four cities away um, from being sustainable. But that's, that's probably another presentation, but certainly the next big challenge that we'll be looking at as a city. And that's it, Michelle. Happy to take questions. Wow. Thank you, Andrea. That was uh, fantastic um, and so so interesting and so um, and so relevant, I know, for so many people on the call. I'd like to invite everyone now who's on the call of access to their computer um, who hasn't dialed in through the phone. But if you're on your computer and you have questions, please put those into the chat box. And I'll be happy to filter through those and get those um, over to Andrea. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and just leave the screen. If you don't mind staying the presenter on where you are, because if I'm the presenter with my slide up, then I can't see the questions. So this is good because it has your contact information. Anyway, um, so many questions that I kind of jotted down as you were talking, you ended up covering during some of the <laughs> during the rest of the presentation, which was great. It was a really complete picture. I guess just starting back from the going back towards the beginning about how you were able to get the plan through. So, you know, you've got the mayor totally committed and then you're sitting on the city council how was the city council completely on board? What kind of, how did you get started? You know, what was step one? Was the step one bringing everybody on the, getting everybody on the council uh, on side with you? Um, well, so we've just gone through an election where we, um, 
had put out there this idea that one of our four big goals was to be the greenest city in the world. So certainly we had a large public mandate. Um, we are, are the party that had held power. We have political parties in Vancouver. Um, they had been reduced quite substantially, so they didn't, I don't think they felt like they had a mandate to fight that mandate. Right. Um, and really, I mean, the first question we put, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, and I, I'm not shy about it, but um, we didn't start by saying, hey, council, let's buy into a 380-page 10-year plan that covers sweeping changes in the city. We said, hey, let's, we, we have this mandate to be the greenest city in the world. Let's convene 16 experts to understand holistic sustainability well in city policy and ask them, what are the targets we have to meet to get there? Once we had that, um, we went to the public and said we had that passed by council unanimously. Uh, then it came back and council approved it in principle and said, but let's take it to the public. And the public question we asked, very important, I think, wasn't what do we need to do? Because I think that's the argument come into play. Um, and frankly, the atmosphere is not negotiating with us. Like we can have all the engagement and consultation sessions mm -hmm. we want on where to set greenhouse targets greenhouse gas targets, um, the atmosphere has a pretty clear answer, right? So yeah. that's the one that we set, and then we engage the public on how are we going to get there. Um, and, and then by the time we got to that, that's probably where normally the political disagreement would have come into play. But at that point, you have 35,000 champions coming into play as well. Mm. Um, so I think that made a critical difference at the, at the toughest decision-making point. Uh, great. So we've got some really uh, juicy questions uh, coming in and uh, aligning okay. with some of the things that I was wondering, too. And I was thinking, I'm wondering, you know, you said that um, you can't just cut and paste a, a policy. It's really got to be customized to your context. And I wondered where did you kind of what other cities did you look for? And you said, you know, you convene this group of experts and someone else uh, was kind of wondering in the national context. Do you are you collaborating with other are you taking some policy ideas from other cities in Canada? Are they taking them from you? And what's what's your relationship with other cities in Canada around policy? Um, good. And I, it is really good. I would say that um, Canada, I'm sure every country feels like it's tough to be that country, right? So I'll tell you the things that we feel are tough about Canada. It's a massive country, right? Like geographically, phenomenally large, right? As I'm sitting here in Vancouver with 15 degrees Celsius and cherry blossoms outside, um, there's people on the other side of the country who are in minus 40 degree blizzard, and then people up north who are in minus 60 degrees, and it won't even be light there today, right? Because it's mm. the middle of winter. Um, so to try and bring understanding and context across that is hard. Um, we also have this we're not really a country as much as we are a federation of subnational governments, the provinces. Mm -hmm. um, so there really isn't a national framework for much. It mostly comes out provincially. So on top of the different um, biogeochromatic challenges we have, um, which create cultural differences, um, we also have radically different provincial legislative frameworks, both in terms of the powers that we have as cities, um, as well as what resources might be available to us, either policy or financial. So it makes collaboration very challenging. What we have learned is that um, our best collaborations are with port cities, because um, that is a key mm -hmm. challenge for us, uh, that are similar in size. They don't have to be so close, but I think uh, we're in the C40 network, for example, and I think we've brought a lot of innovative ideas there. I think it's very hard for us to understand what it's like to run a city of 8 million people, right? It's a right. really different environment. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we do collaborate with Canadian cities. We collaborate a lot more with Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, because we have similar climates, we have similar cultures, we have similar demographic challenges, even though we don't have similar national or, or subnational framework. Yes, I was wondering that in terms of culturally, just thinking about you had, you know, 2,000 people pay to be able to hear your plan and be able to make comments of it. And I live in San Francisco, which is also is a very strong public participation in the planning process. And I wondered, so that was, um, you know, it's a very striking visual seeing all those people in the seats. Is that, do you feel like there's something particular to your local culture that would make that many people want to come out? Is there a long history of that kind of engagement? 
Um, yeah, I think Vancouver does have a reputation for um, engagement. You know, interestingly, the freeway and this um, this effort in the late 60s and early 70s, every city, major city in North America, certainly U.S. and Canada, um, was knocking out poor areas on the edges of downtown, plowing freeways through like that was what we called urban renewal. Um, the fight against that freeway here that was successful birthed a generation of activists, largely baby boomers, just because that's the age that they were active at, um, who then took that and used it to build very strong engagement structures. The challenge is, if you're not from that generation, those structures have now become alienating. Mm. Um, they're very analog. Um, the people in them all seem to know each other. They all own homes. And as I pointed out, half the city doesn't. Um, so it's weird because we have this incredibly strong engagement culture, but it excludes large chunks of demographics. So that, that picture you saw, um, actually, I would say that was largely made up of people who have wanted in mm -hmm. on engagement, but haven't felt connected in the old paradigm. Interesting. And a question that comes up uh, from one of our uh, listeners as well um, is related to in the process of community outreach, was there was there a sentiment or opposition kind of associating green with unaffordable or gentrification? And if so, how were you able to kind of over overcome those concerns? <laughs> yeah, I just funnily enough, I was giving a talk this morning to a group of teachers um, and this issue came up, I, you know, we, it's not our only goal. We, we have other plans and goals and other policy areas. Uh, the way that we really did it, like the people who are in that audience, it's a bit of a blurry picture, but if you really look at it, they trend younger, um, so therefore likely lower income. Uh, renters everywhere, because this is, you know, if you can't control your private space, your interest in controlling public space, in my observation, becomes much more latent, because mm. <laughs> that's where you're spending a lot of your community life, right? Like a community garden becomes very interesting to you because that's the only access you're going to have to yeah. a garden space. Um, so it's sort of inherently linked in, but there's a whole, like we really, we call it the triple word score. If we can align the green policy with the affordability policy, with the empowering traditionally marginalized populations, those are the winner projects. Like those are the ones that are going to go up faster than the ones that don't meet all of those three uh, criteria. Right. Um, and it was so illustrative to so, see. Uh, go, go on. Well, I was going to say that picture I showed of the farm um, with the, the big stadium in the background, mm -hmm. um, that's an example of a project where we're employing uh, 20, I think it's about 24 folks at that one site um, who have mental health issues, oftentimes dual diagnosis, drug addiction, um, previously recently homeless um, but who have been connected now with supports, uh, health supports, housing supports, other supports, and are also growing food, which, you know, it's growing food for sure, but food is very, uh, it's not just a job, right? The, the concept of nurturing a seed to a piece of food, and then that food is something that someone else values, it does a lot for their recovery, right? Mm -hmm. So projects like that is really where we tried to focus to show that you know, if green is about efficient use of resources that it's based, the people who have the least access to resources currently are the ones who could most benefit from access. It's not inherent, but you can build it that way, and that's how um, we have built it, and that's where we're getting the successes on that. Great. I want to, um, there are some, so many good questions coming in, and there's another one related to also to engagement, and it's about how the private sector um, was the private sector involved in developing any of these policies? Have they embraced the policies? Can you talk more about the kind of role they're playing? Yeah, heavily engaged. Um, we really invited them in. Like we, we have suffered for many decades in Canada from a, a, a national narrative about jobs versus the environment, the economy versus the environment. Um, so we really wanted the private sector in at the ground level. I would say that. Um, Definitely not universal, but, you know, the initial reactions were, I'm with the Urban Development Institute. What does green have to do with me? Or I'm mm -hmm. with uh, whatever. Like, I'm not a green business, right? Uh, and we're like, no. <laughs> but we all, you know, we all eat. We all breathe air. We all need water. Um, and this needs to be a, a citywide effort. And I think 
there was definitely some uh, unease at the beginning, but as time has gone on, example of the green building policy, we just did a, a massive update to our building code and have two more planned in 2017 and 2020 to get to the carbon neutral standard. Um, and really, the business community owned it and probably went further than we would ever have put out there to them. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. we wouldn't have proposed such a, a, a big first step. Um, but as they felt a sense of agency and in some control over it, they have proposed much bigger steps than we imagined that they would agree from, from us. So uh, I think it really is. I don't think people go to work and decide they're not an environmentalist and then go home and recycle, right? Like most people want these outcomes in all facets of their lives, um, but it's figuring out how do you engage them in a, a non-traditional, if business is not viewed as traditionally writing green policy, how do we make them feel welcome and like they have something to contribute there? So you did direct outreach to some organizations that represent the building industry then as a way to get in touch with oh, them? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Not just direct <laughs> outreach, but like persistent, like take it like, you know, let's go for coffee, let's go for lunch, like really trying to make them feel like this is not an us and them. This is not the Canadian dialogue of you versus the environment, right? This mm -hmm. is this is a new narrative about how we all pull together in this direction. And frankly, we think it will be beneficial for them, and certainly it has been. Green buildings, uh, particularly commercial green buildings in Vancouver, are like they're doing quite well economically, right, relative mm -hmm. to the non-green buildings. Um, I had a question uh, related uh, uh, just for my own clarification on the green building policy. You said all buildings were going to be carbon neutral by 2020. Now, is that public and private buildings or yes. just public? No, all of the above. Everybody. And that's my building and it existing. Crazy, but uh, it will be all new buildings um, mm -hmm. and existing. So this is this retrofit neighborhood energy tension. Mm -hmm. We've. I wouldn't say we've abandoned retrofits, like we still have a small, a modest program that matches the size of demand, e even with intensive advertising and incentives. Um, and we've really put our energy on the neighborhood energy side, because if we can get zero or very low emission energy into the building, um, we can buy time to deal with the efficiency of the building, and time itself will renew that building stock. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we just... We gave up on trying to make buildings more efficient in favor of making the energy more efficient. Okay. And wait, just to clarify, and it's also so residential and commercial buildings. So. Yeah. Yeah. And all of, like, we hold ourselves to a higher standard still on our public buildings. We try and show through our public buildings, here's what you can accomplish so that the private sector, um, when we get to the legislating requirements phase, it says, you know, we can do this, right? Because you're doing this. Okay, great. Um, I want to go back to some of the um, some of the caller questions, and one is something uh, you touched on a little bit, and I think there's even more to this as we, when we were um, speaking the other day. But just you know, so some cities, a lot of cities come out and they want to be the greenest city or the most sustainable or the first net zero city. Um, so if you could share a little bit more about some of the kind of uh, economic benefits and the unexpected economic benefits of, of pursuing this policy. I think that would be great. Yeah, well, so the, on the economy side, uh, like the green economy generally, when we were developing the greenest city, so bear in mind that we were elected a month after the economy, the global recession happened. So, <laughs> so when we pegged out this goal to be the greenest city in the world, it was in the context of like January 2008 when the economy was rocking and everybody was doing awesome mm -hmm. and sky's the limit kind of concept. Uh, so, you know, it was definitely a key question. So that's why the green economy piece has been so central in it. Um, it's also, incidentally, why we charge people to go to the consultation. <laughs> like through, through all of it, it had to be like cost neutral until the momentum got going. Um, on the green economy side, no question, like we have, you don't win forever, but as of today, we have definitely won the green economy prize in Canada. And if you've won the green economy prize, if you're the city that owns the green brand, um, that has the, the hubs and the clusters that make it attractive for other green businesses to attract, you are two to three times more likely to have a growing economy on the planet right now, right? And that is 
why we have a growing economy, whereas some of our, our cities to the east of us um, who are all in on oil and gas and um, liquefied natural gas, they're in some pretty big trouble right now, right? They have very quickly contracting economies with signs that it will become worse. So certainly, I mean, who knew this is what 2015 would look like? Yeah. But I think the point is you shouldn't have to, in, in the world we live in, the future is going to be uncertain. Um, so build the most resilient and diversified economy you can. On the cost saving side, again, if it's about efficient use of resources, um, the, the move from, we were at about 50% diversion before we, we brought in these aggressive targets. Uh, now we're inching up on 70% diversion. It's had a corresponding decrease in our waste management budget because we're managing less waste, right? We're still diverting, mm -hmm. um, but materials recovery is a lot more cost effective than landfilling or incinerating something. Yeah, that was such an interesting picture you had of the deconstruction of houses. So is that a policy around deconstruction or can you tell us more about that picture? I know it was way back at the beginning. Yeah, we yeah, we brought that in. Um, so the two biggest by um, mass impacts on our landfill and our incinerators are um, food, organic waste, and then also housing and, and construction waste. Mm -hmm. uh, so the deconstruction policy was brought in as a voluntary um, option in 2010, I'm going to say, 2011. And then last year, we formalized it, that you must deconstruct. Wow. Um, and in the next building code update, we will, um, uh, and it's amazing, 94% diversion, right? And these are heavy. A house is a very heavy, large object to be throwing out. Yeah. Um, probably seems obvious, but when you multiply that, we have about 800 tons a year going into a landfill. That's a lot going in. So 94% um, diversion, and it's also helping us um, recover heritage, uh, you know, windows, doors, whatever, which mm -hmm. means that less homes are being torn down because they need have the materials that they need to be able to do the renovations that they want to do. Right. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to decide. We've got a time for maybe one more question and uh, it's challenging to know which to pick, but I guess I want to talk a little bit more about uh, collaboration and your work with other cities since we've got so many people from around the world on this call. You, you mentioned you work with 2000 other cities. How do you work with those cities? And, you know, or so I know you mentioned also being a part of the C40 network. Uh, can you share a little bit more of that? And if cities are wanting to get in touch with you, besides coming to our fantastic tour happening in June, what's, uh, can you tell us more about that collaboration, and how they might do that? Yeah, so I'll be really honest, we, we don't have a system for it, and we've identified that this year, 2015, is something we need to deal with. I think Copenhagen, um, they have a, a program sharing Copenhagen, something like that. It's a formal um, structure that they have both for working with other cities, for their own residents to learn more about the programs they're doing, as well as uh, how to compost or how to whatever. Uh, so we're really looking at that model this year, but for now, um, basically you send me an email or you send our Office of Sustainability mm -hmm. an email and we work really hard to connect you as well as we can. Um, because of that nucleus structure I showed you mm -hmm. um, of the steering committee and the internal advisory committees and the external, um, there are uh, close to 500 people represented by those circles, so we can find someone to connect you with that can, can be the, the best uh, receptor, right, for what you're doing. We also have a few partnerships. We have hundreds, over 100 partnerships, but a few in particular with the University of British Columbia, which is one of our two big post-secondaries. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a formal memorandum of understanding. So in some cases, especially if it's around evidence-based uh, research, like if you wanted to understand what we learned about deconstruction, we'd probably send you in that direction. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a very innovative thing. Uh, all of the post-secondaries in Vancouver, we convinced them to work together on a project called City Studio, uh, and that's become a really great conduit for cities that are trying to answer the question of green, but in the context of innovation. So mm -hmm. uh, if you look up City Studio Vancouver. Um, their website does a better job of explaining it than I'd be able to do in the time we have left. Um, great. Thank you so much. I um, am hoping to uh, use this uh, time to also talk a little bit about the tour that we're going to be doing to Vancouver and in a few weeks. Um, 
and might have you uh, chip in a little bit when I talk about our workshop. So for all of you on the call, you should know that the World GBC is offering a Sustainable Cities Initiative tour to Vancouver. Hopefully you can see my um, a little picture of the flyer we'll be distributing in the very near future. It's great. We've got a full day of green building tours, so some leading net zero buildings, some of those at the um, UBC campus, uh, which Andrea just mentioned. Also, looking at a district energy system as part of the Olympic Village. So looking at some of some of that technology as well. And then on our second day, we've got actually a half day workshop uh, with the city of Vancouver for all of our delegates and talking about five big ideas, I think, is one of the key points. And then it'd be kind of a roundtable discussion. So we'll be able to meet with Andrea and some of her colleagues to do a deep dive. So if any GBCs or city representatives would like to join that um, join that program, we would love to have you. It's all available on the World GBC website and we'll be distributing lots of information. We're also going to be doing a, a tour of um, a walking tour of two neighborhoods uh, for, for really leading examples of urban regeneration in Vancouver. With that final plug of our program, I'm wondering, Andrea, if you have any last words for our delegates? Yeah, sure. I really wanted to thank you for the time today. Um, I probably should have said up front, our aspiration to be the greenest city in the world has never been about winning. Um, I mean, of course, we love to win, but it's not really the goal. The goal is the sustainability. Like, the, like we're trying to race for the top of the mountain. Um, our hope was that we could inspire our residents to want to be in that race, and but also other cities and individuals. And, you know, it, it has been very inspiring to see it go around the planet. I've been reading your questions as they come in, and I'm fighting the urge to answer them all directly. But I guess I would say that, broadly speaking, I think we share the same twin challenges of, uh, the climate question and, and sustainability at an environmental level. We're watching resources um, depleted and the impact of that on our communities. But it's, it's reflected in your questions and reflected in my comments that when resources are being depleted, it also has huge social impact. So I think if you come here, you get a good opportunity to sort of see how we've been trying to bridge that gap, how we, um, by empowering the environment, are also empower empowering people in our communities who traditionally um, haven't felt empowered either economically or even if they have some economic capacity, they're not part of the discussion about what what next for the world, right? What next for this economy? What next for this social structure? Um, and I think the more we have people coming from Latin America, from Asia, from Europe, from Africa, the more Australia, sorry, is another one that we do a lot of collaboration with, the more we can come to that answer sooner, the more we're talking together. So whether it's through coming here or via email or Twitter or whatever makes the most sense for you, I hope we can keep the discussion going. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been a great discussion. For those of you on the call, we have recorded this. If you'd like to share it with your any of your colleagues, or your networks, uh, please do so. It will be posted on our website. And uh, thank you again, Andrea, and have a wonderful day. And I look forward to seeing you in June.